So I did give a handout, Ladybugs, that's at the back wall front. Oh, thank you, you're so good, appreciate that. Um, ladybugs, we sell hundreds of ladybugs. I mean, lots of ladybugs. And the biggest complaint I get is, um, they fly away. They're wing. God gave them wings. So if you release them in the wrong way, just kind of take one of those, just for your own amusement or, or, or whatever. Uh, it's how to release them. Highly effective against thrip aphids. One ladybug in its lifetime will eat 5,000 aphids. They are ferocious. Uh, but the secret is to chill them before you let them get, like, put them in the refrigerator. Really, just put them in the reefer, chill them down to like mid-30s. They'll be fine. They slow down and go into stasis. Then you go release them uh, at the base of the plants where you might have problems, especially with our subject matter. Uh, fruit trees, uh, grapes, brambles, black, blueberries, blackberries, all that stuff. It's a good organic way to keep, keep, them, keep them around. And then once you release you release ladybugs, you seem to have them all year round. They seem to be a magnet. They draw, they fly away and disperse, but they seem to draw more ladybugs into the yard. So you'll find that you always have them out in the yard. And so there's something about it. Like they send off a signal going, food is here, come and dine with me. And so they seem to always attract other, other bugs, which is good, great beneficial. Today's class is on grapes, brambles, and berries. Probably pretty short, unless we get a lot of questions. It's a smaller crowd, so we can kind of interact a little bit. That's great. Um, and what I did is, I did, I'm not going to go over all the best varieties. There's too many of them. If you want to see all the grapes, brambles, and berries, they're up against the wall. Go straight out this door, right up against the wall. There's like a 50-foot row of nothing but different varieties, from vineyard grapes to dwarf blueberries. I've even got dwarf grapes that are made to grow on patios, decks, in containers. So we've got the whole schmooze. I mean, there's a ton of them. And we've stocked up for you all, because we know we're into hardcore gardeners here. This is, out of all the garden topics, we are down into gardener territory. It's not like, I want to grow a tomato. How do I do that? That's like, everyone does that. This is, you all are unique. It says something that you're sitting in a seat today, taking a class on growing better grapes and blueberries. I grow a lot of blueberries, a lot of grapes. I grow a few blueberries, I love when my mouth's watering. Think about picking blueberries off the bush and popping them in your mouth. They never make them in the house. They always get picked right there on the patio. I'll give you a secret on that one as well. Uh, how to plant, I'm gonna go over how to plant, best varieties, when to plant, all that kind of stuff. Okay? And then how to produce more fruit. What you'll find in an arid climate is that the fruit is smaller, but there's a plethora of them and they're sweeter. They're better tasting than let's, let's say California or the Northwest or some other areas. They are like candy. But the dryness seems to dwarf them about 20%. I grew uh, grapes in California as well, Northern California. Uh, we did a corporate stint up in Sacramento, Folsom. My son was born in Roseville. Those of you that know Northern California, those are all big names. Uh, so we grew some spectacular grapes. And that's, that's in the middle of grape country. Uh, I mean, People come together just to sample their wines that they're making. You, you, you cringe every time you're invited because you know it's going to be vinegar, you know it's going to be bad, but you're invited because it's part of that culture. They just come and they get together, have a meal, test the new new batch. You can do that here too, and have great, very good, good production, very, very good. Um, so, grapes. I brought an example of a grape, and I just went through and I picked. I wasn't looking for a variety. I was looking for what kind of uh, sample, what kind of shape, what kind of, uh, what am I looking for in a grape? And this is a great example. Uh, what kind is this? A red grape. So it's a table grape, seedless. It'll grow like weeds. It's already waking up. This thing will produce tendrils or, or vines on it that are out to, I mean, it'll go out to 10, 15 feet. It's amazing how fast vines, like the grapes grow. I grow these up and down my fence line where the property is. Uh, I have a cedar fence, kind of sterile looking, means fences are pretty if you're a contractor, but otherwise, if you're a gardener, they're ugly. Just big sterile wall sitting there. No matter how you paint it, try to soften it, it's just ugly. So I put brambles and grapes up and down the line, and it makes it feel more secret garden feel. Got some trellises that lean up against the, the fence that help it grow. It's very, very nice. It produces very heavy. 
The reason I picked this form is what I'm looking for in a grape is a real long, real long vine. And I'm, I'm gonna pinch these off when I plant it. So I'm looking for more, I, I printed all the way up to here, and I would plant this sucker all the way up to this deep. Grapes are one of the only plants that will actually form roots up and down its, its vine. So I'm looking to go as deep as I can. I mean, I'll set that thing down. I've, I've put planted grapes three feet deep. I mean, it is deep. So I get more moisture, more food. It's just a more robust kind of, kind of vine. So a lot of the vines over there, you'll see big long canes coming out, big long uh, vines coming out right at the base. I'm not really looking for that unless I have to. A certain variety that I just really want. But out of that whole bin, let's say there's 20 different Concord grapes. Look for one that's a little more leggy looking, that exposes a little more that 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 uh, base cane, and then plant it real deep, and you'll get more roots off of that. Don't do that with anything else. If you do that with a berry, if you get a blackberry with even a little bit of soil on its on its cane coming up, it'll die like that. Only with grapes. So I'm a little sensitive. You got to be really careful. But this is one where I really try to go deep. And grapes have roots that go down to China, very deep. So I water these much like I do my trees and my shrubs. In fact, they're on the same system as trees and shrubs. Roses, they're all the same system. I water it once a week. It's about right. A deep, deep soak. So I'm trying to get this much soil and then more. I want that, that, that water to be pushed real deep into, um, into that soil. If you don't do that, what will happen is it'll start to form grapes mid-summer. It'll be real hot, I mean, into June, first part of July, if the monsoons come, it'll have some grape clusters on there and it'll shed its grapes because the roots are not deep enough. So, and it got dry and a grape, any of these fruits, they'll shed their fruit like that. They'll sacrifice the fruit to keep the core of the plants alive. And so to prevent that, I try to, especially with my grapes, I try to go real deep, and then I'll fertilize them. We'll cover food yet, but water, I'll just deep water them, and then I'll let them dry out. The danger is going to be, if you're, into, if you're into watering, like you water your plants every day, which is not good for trees and shrubs, that's terrible. You're creating a root structure that's only about six inches deep, and then they go out like this because they can't breathe. You're, you're, you're suffocating them. You're drowning them. It's like holding your little puppy dog underneath the pool for like days. What's the chances of it living? None. Well, same with your plants. They like deep watering, then they need to breathe in between, especially fruit trees. Really sensitive to fruit trees, okay? Fruit, fruiting trees, shrubs, brambles, grapes, all that stuff. It's all the same. Make sense? Okay. All right, grapes, grow them. Um, also, what do I grow them on, Ken? What do I need? I don't think, that if you start to Google stuff, and you're searching online for, for grape information, all you're gonna get is vineyard growth information, agriculture, big business, and it's, it gets confusing. Residential or backyard gardening, I think we have a lot more flex, a lot more options to us. For me, my gardens have to be pretty first, then they have to produce. If it doesn't look good, I, it's not welcome in my yard. I'm not into, I'm way past my grandparents' place where it was plants in a row, marching across a yard like soldiers. It's, I think we can blend garden with the artistic ability, with production, with, it can be pretty and. So for my yard, I have a six foot fence. So the book says only go to five foot or four foot or whatever, have one vine, have a, have a, have a a wire going across, have it one T come across. For me, what I did, I have a double T, so I did prune all my grapes, have been pruned back now. And so from the, from the surface of the, of the garden to the top, I go six foot, because I want to go to the top of the fence. I want it to be a secret garden. I want it to be foliage, I want it to be full of life and exploding, spilling over, and the bonus is grapes coming out. I want it to look good first. So I trained it to six foot. That's not what the book will tell you to do. That's, my name's Ken, I'm your friend. This is what I do, and this is, I think it would work for you too, and you still get lots and lots of grapes. You might not get as many hundreds of bushels per acre foot, whatever, 
but we're not measuring that in our backyard. We just need, you'll actually have off of one vine way more than you can really use. I mean, my grandson and I, we go out, we eat until we are sick. We just sit there and we just eat grapes until we're sick. And then there's still some left. And so you, you'll have plenty. I go to the top, tee it off, and it's, it's cut back to about right here right now. It has not woken up. My, my yard, my grapes have not woken up yet. So the buds are swelling pretty good. I predict after this rain, they'll go crazy. I mean, I think they'll wake up pretty quick. Halfway down at the three foot mark, I have another tee. So I have a double tee coming off. And everything's been trimmed back to the main trunk and then two, two canes. I'm gonna train to go out this way along the fence. Does it make sense? And, and it looks good. I'm trying to soften up that big fence. Um, it would be easier if I had a chain link fence just because then I could tie it into there easily. A cedar fence is a little harder because it's just planks back and forth. And so I, I actually took a trellis and I, I, I actually attached it to the fence so I could train up this, this vine better, easier. Okay, That's how I did it. I think you can be, you just don't have to listen to everything you read on the, on the internet or a book. It's all gonna be, especially for grapes and berries, it's all gonna be about major agribusiness, major production, because they're growing for Costco. Uh, they're, they're trying to get more produce coming off of that. For us, I think we can be a little more, we can flex with that a lot more. Does that make sense? So have fun with it. You do need to prune, you need to butcher grapes. You need to cut them way back, or else they won't produce as heck. So, okay, questions on grapes? Yes. I've been raised, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Okay, I'm in raised beds that are two and a half feet high. And that's Excellent. My, is that deep enough? So she's got great beds. She's going to plant grapes in a two and a half foot I'm raised bed. I'm grapes. jealous already. Oh. That should be excellent. I mean, that much soil, that's, that's great. Okay. I would dig that plant. I would take that grape, two and a half feet. Okay. I, would, I would get a real tall grape, and I would try to go as down to the bottom of that bed if I could. I'd rest it right on the native soil, whatever's down there you yeah. put it onto. I'd have as much soil in that as you could. Yeah, You'll have that. amazing production. Just amazing. In the back. And when I bought my house, and we turned the in there, some of the lines and canes were like 16, 17 feet long. Yeah, wow. Oh my gosh. So like two or three years ago, I imagine. Yeah. And they said cut all the way back, and I did. So it was 60 feet, maybe like this high, maybe this big, not too much. Well, it's too late, you're already committed. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be fine. It's hard to kill a grape. What will happen is you've gone from huge, unmaintained for years, down to I'm trying to get control of this thing. I mean, it looks like Jurassic Park. If you let it go, it looks like a jungle out there. It's just, it'll take over. They need to be cut back. What may happen is this year, it might affect how much, how many grapes that it produces. It may affect that, I doubt it, but it may. Uh, but next year will be unbelievable. Oh my gosh, you'll be you'll be wowed. So I think you're fine. Yeah, in the back. How long has yours been in the ground? Oh, so long I forgot. Seven, eight years, something like that. Something like that. The trunks on them are pretty good size. Not not tree formed. They can get quite large, but they're they're about that big. And I add some grapes up and down the line every once in a while. So I'll see a new one here, and I go, oh, I haven't grown that one. I'll just try it. I mainly do table grapes for myself. I don't, I don't do wine grapes. But the technique is the same. A grape is a grape is a grape. The other question comes up as far as varieties go. This is mainly my Midwest folks. They go, well, what about what's the hardiest variety? Because they'll get eight foot frost lines. They need the hardiest varieties of grapes. So they'll do the hemrods instead of the Thompsons because hemrods are much more. They have more antifreeze. They're much more robust in very cold climates. What I find here. It doesn't matter. We're so mild. We just don't get that kind of cold. We do get a frost line. It's only like this, this deep. It's pretty, have the variety you want. Uh, so we do get into really obscure varieties. So someone's putting in a vineyard now. They were asking for something I've never, I've never even heard of. And I go, you know, I don't, I, you're the only one in the entire town that wants that. I'm not gonna bring that into the store because I'll be sitting on the other eight. You only wanted two. I'm only going to bring in the most varieties, the best, most popular varieties here. I will get a lot more varieties than, say, a big boxwell. 
just because I have more gardener shopping here. I've got more people that will buy the in interesting, freaky, weird, and gardeners will try new things. So pearl, little pearl uh, uh, grapes, I can sell those. I bring them in, no one else can, but I can because I have gardeners who want to try things. And as a gardener, I think it's okay. I reserve 10% of my gardens for things I've never heard of, grown before, I've read about, I saw them, I, 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 I get them. It's like, it's like Christmas here. I work at a Christmas shop for gardeners. Every time those truck doors come open from the, from the farms, I go, that's me. So 10% of my gardens, are just for things I've never grown before, and you've never heard of, just, just for fun. Just Now most of it's too dedicated to production, like proving themselves, but I think gardening, part of gardening is just to have fun, just to try it and see. And gardeners, I've learned, never tell a gardener they can or cannot do something. I mean, they will prove you, they will find a way to make that thing grow. And you know, I want to grow a palm tree, well I don't grow up here. Oh, yes, I will. I'm going to try I'm going to go to Phoenix and get one. Try it. And, and you'll hear rumors of them for, for two, three years. Then they forget and then it dies. So the gardeners will they'll find a way to make it grow. Okay. Grapes. When do you prune grapes? When do you prune grapes? Very good question. You prune grapes from the new year through March. So you're a little bit late, but not too late. They haven't woken up yet. Really get them done before they wake up. Grapes are formed on new growth. There you go, that's why you cut them back. So you don't want old, stubby, witty growth out there. You want, you want to cut it back so it, has, it encourages all that root mass to form, a, to form new vines so you get more grapes on the vine. That's why you're pruning. I'll feature one last and we'll move on to blackberries and raspberries. This is really cool. Uh, this is a miniature grape. I didn't know they made such a thing until this one. It's called Petite. Pixie, it's a, uh, uh, it's just a, it's just a miniature grape. This only gets this big, and stays like this. So if you've got a deck or something, you want something fun, and you I mean you want to invite friends over and watch a sunset with a glass of Chardonnay, this is one they will be really impressed with, because you're growing a grape in a, in a container. I grow a lot of berries in containers, the miniature berries, but we've not had access to miniature grapes. So have fun with it. Okay. I would not put a regular grape in a in a pot because they're just too big, too aggressive. Yeah. Does it get fruit on it? Oh, it does. Oh, it's loaded. Look at it. How big? Loaded with, with grapes. Oh, it only gets this big. Oh, three by three, something like that. Oh, the grapes are smaller, but okay. but they're they make up for it in quantity. Okay. Are they seeds? Um, you know, this is brand new. I've never grown this. Oh. I don't, let's, we'll read the tag together later. Oh. I just got excited going, it's miniature. I've never seen that. That's neat. So I, I still I get excited. I've been doing this for, for decades, and I still come to work and get excited. I look forward to coming to work every day. It's like not work. It's a joy. And that's why, that's why I tend to get a little excited sometimes or animated. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to, to uh, blackberries, raspberries. Uh, we grow a lot of blackberries and raspberries. They do very, very well. Now, Indian Summer Heritage are the most popular raspberries. They're also the most thorny. <clears throat> They're just like, you're gonna be, you're gonna look like you got in a cat fight every time you go pick raspberries. But they produce like crazy. They're kind of the old heritage type varieties, and we, we have those out there. I brought this one as an example, just one out of the mix, because I like this particular one. This is a thornless blackberry. Um, you could touch this, you could hug this, and it would still be fine. It doesn't bite you. And so a lot of blackberries, even blackberries have even larger thorns than a raspberry does. And they really want to like eat your face off. This one, you, you can brush up against it, and it's fine. And so blackberries tend to get long canes. I mean, this one will grow, mine will push off 10 foot canes pretty easily. I um, mean, it just gets long, arching. I mean, I was walking underneath my canes already. It's starting to grow, and it's got such large arches I can walk. I am six, well over six foot. I can walk right underneath it, and it just felt magical. It felt like a secret curtain. That's what I want. And so what I do is, on my fence, I try to keep them cut back. I don't let them exceed their space. They're allowed about a three, four foot space. Actually, by the end of the year, it's more like five or six feet. They tend to really be aggressive. I try to keep them up against the fence and grow this way. And I'm able to do that. And they're years old. 
I get so many blackberries, I cannot eat them all, literally. I mean, bowls and bowls and bowls. Um, I don't have too many problems with my birds. They're, they're, they, they can have a few of them, but it's not like apples and peaches, and they, they really go after those fruit trees. Berries, not as interested. We'll get a few, though. Um, the secret with blackberries, do not let any soil touch when you plant this. Do not plant this deep at all. Be at soil level or even a little above. It does not like to be in a divot. It does not like any soil to touch the top of this new cane or it will get crown rot. It's notorious for just dying. It'll, that, that particular cane will die off. So one thing, just I've experienced, kind of watch that one when you plant it. When I do plant, I do use quite a bit of mulch or compost to enrich the soil. It's, the berries seem to really like that, even more so than grapes. So I tend to get a bag of mulch and just really amend that soil around that. I'll dig out all the, all the rocks and the debris, that kind of stuff. Um, that seems to really be a, a increase of the production. My, bait, my berries, I do tend to have to feed them more regularly. So about every other month, I fertilize my grapes, my berries, my raspberries. They tend to be heavy feeders because they push on such such heavy growth. I mean, just large. They're such they're so aggressive. It takes some food to really get that much growth on them. What I do is I'll go chuck a few handfuls of this all-purpose plant food uh, about every other month. I'll start in March. I'll just do it about every other month. I make sure to put this on right before the monsoon season. That seems to be a game changer. So end of June, first part of July. I'll fertilize real heavy, and as soon as that monsoon hits, the, the humidity goes up. There might be an afternoon rain, there might not, but the humidity goes up, and those plants just go crazy. And I really get more cane, more growth, more fruit at that point, July through the end of fall, just because I'm fertilizing just before the monsoons come, the rains come, it gets, gets that food in there, and it really makes a difference on, on this gardener's uh, uh, production on, on my berries and grapes. Okay. They're a little heavy, heavier feeders than, let's say, fruit trees or your other pine trees, that kind of stuff. There I say, yeah, two, three times a year, fertilize them, they're good to go. But not, not as much. I need to fertilize a little heavier with my grapes and my, my blackberries and raspberries in the back. Oh. <laughs> they have medication for that now. <laughs> You know, never mind. I won't touch. You set me up for that. I won't touch you. Yeah, go ahead. Did you cut the, the branches back? Oh, good question. Do I cut the, the canes back? Here's a secret with with all your all your berry plants. Okay. Well, not all. Prime Gem is the only one that you can butcher any way you want. Still produces fruit. Prime Gem blackberries produce fruit on fr first year wood. Most all other varieties that I know of, and I might be off by one, but basically all other berries, they produce fruit on last year's cane. So that big long cane that grew up and didn't really put a berry on it, it will be loaded this year. So what I do is I'll mark which cane, so I've got a 10, 12 foot cane coming up, produced like crazy, I'll put a little piece of twine, a bird tape, that's where I'll put my scare tape, I love scare tape because uh, it scares the birds away, keeps them off my fruits. It's a good way to mark that. And I'll go, that's the one I want to cut out next year. So this winter, because you'll forget, you picked all the berries, you go, what, they all look the same, What's going, which one do I go for? The ones with the scare tape on it, I'll cut that right back to the ground. Then I'll keep all the ones that were growing from last year but didn't bury. That's where I'm going to get my berries this year, this summer. And that's just a little trick that really seems to work. And the scare tape, I used to use yarn and jute wire, whatever I had laying around. But I kind of want to keep the birds off anyway. The, the scare tape kind of, that may be why the birds don't, don't affect my fruits so much. They might affect yours. Yeah. Do they grow on travel food or do you just let them go? I've trained them to go up. I do have some trellises on some of them. My raspberries, I tend to trellis more. My blackberries, they've got such big canes on them, they seem to hold themselves up. In fact, they get so big, they almost, they'll, they'll keep the fence up, almost. So they get pretty aggressive. They start to come up in other places. I don't want them to come up. If they're coming up, 
where I don't want them. They get a shovel to the head, I pop them out, I throw them, I thin them. If they're coming up down the line, I kind of go, go, be free, I'll fertilize you, grow, grow, and they'll spread. So you'll never have just one bramble, you'll have multiples, you'll have patches of brambles. And so you have blackberries and raspberries. I also have some new varieties. Um, I grow this one, it's coming out right now. This one I brought up just because it's starting to form uh, raspberries. This is called raspberry shortcake. It's a miniature raspberry. It doesn't get long canes. It stays bush form. So I have this in a big pot, and I brought an example of a pot. This is the minimum size pot I would grow these big fruiting plants in. Mine are a little bit bigger than this. I brought this as an example of the minimum size. Don't go smaller, or you won't be able. You won't have enough soil to, to produce. They'll dry out. They'll shed. They just won't fruit as well for you. But if you go a little bit bigger, mine's in a pot about this big, about that deep. It's been in there for years. This, this exact plant, it gets up about this big and it produces very, very well for me. I did it as an experiment, just to have fun, play with it, see how it produced. And it's just, I just think it's a pretty plant. You just look at it and you go, that's, I, as a gardener, you go, that's pretty. But then when guests come over, the grandkids come over, they think it's like magic. They get to go pick fruit from the container gardens. That's like spreading the magic of gardening to the next generation. That's part of my goal with my, my grandkids. Uh, so this is one of those plants that does that. Okay, question. So. That's called raspberry shortcake. Raspberry shortcake. Yep, it's a dwarf variety. I've got several varieties over there. Um, I'm trying to bring in more dwarf varieties in because they're just easy for anyone. Um, and you can now have them on the deck, the patios, the entrances. You can have them more places just out there in the landscape. So, and yet they, they produce heavy sweet berries. Very, very, very tasty. Raspberry shortcake. Do you use just potting soil and then supplement with something? Boring? With this, with a pot like this, here I'll just, I'll leave this as an inspiration piece. There you go. Visualize. Ooh. Buy more grapes. <laughs> Buy, you know. uh, what I would use. Uh, we've made, this is our growers mix. This has been, uh, we've been tweaking this recipe for enough for about 15 years. I've not been able to find another potting soil that grows better. When we sell the, the uh, Fox Farms, these fancy, fancy, schmancy, they're three times the price of this one, and it does not grow better than this one. I sell it because the pot growers want it. They, they, that's the one they, they, they sell to you, they, they make to use, and I make a lot of money on that one. But quite frankly, I, I use this one myself, and it's a third the price of, the, of some of the national big up-end uh, brands. I don't use miracle Grow. Can I say that on film? Sorry, you miracle just Grow. Don't use that garbage. It doesn't, it's not, it is not good stuff. You will struggle with that, guaranteed. You will absolutely struggle. I've stopped selling that soil. I just said that is enough. I'm not gonna torture my gardeners with that stuff. So you use water's potting soil. And you'll find, I just fill the pot up and I plant right directly in it. A good potting soil, you should not have to do anything to it. It's made to plant directly into. And so it's a fine line, it's a razor's edge. You want a soil that will stay moist, yet aerated enough to let plants root quickly. So we'll actually seed, seed in this, cuttings, whatever. But it really does well in big pots. Uh, smaller raised beds, that kind of stuff. In the back. Uh, going back to cutting the canes back. Yes. When do you do that? Is that the January? Okay, canes will be January. All, let's see, all of these, every one of them, all your fruiting plants, and we just make sure, I mean, going through the catalog, all of them, it's New Year's through about March. By after March, we start to get warm. I mean, you can tell it's April. Things are really starting to ignite with new growth. I mean, just it's really from the new year before they wake up, if you can, okay? That's fruit trees, apples, pears, cherries, blackberries, raspberries, grapes, all of them. Currants, elderberries, all of them. You, you'll, you'll gooseberries, all of them. New Year's through, through the March is ideal, okay? Pick a time that you want. I generally wait till about March myself, because if, if I'm tempted to go out on a nice day in January, but then I've seen where we go sub-zero, some winters, we, we get some freaky winters. And now I've cut it back. The canes aren't, the canes actually insulate the plant some. They keep it a little bit warmer. They'll keep some of the snow off. They keep some of the frost. 
I find if I wait to do it a little bit longer, this is just personal experience, the book says January through March. I, I tend to push it towards the back end of that, and so I'll wait until March, really, to really do cut it back, because we're past the harshest winters in the mountains. We don't have harsh winter at that point. The, the, the coldest month is January, then by Valentine's Day, it's starting to get pretty nice. Yeah, we can get some snow, but that bitter, eat through your bones kind of, kind of cold, that's done by then. So I, that's what I, I do myself. Okay. Blueberries do not like dry climates, and they don't like alkalinity. They like very acidic soil. So when you plant this in the ground, you'll want a really rich, very heavy soil. This will do very well for your big raised beds because you're bringing in artificial soil. So organics makes, makes things acidic. So for me, I struggle in the ground. I have raised beds. My, my entire gardens are just a bunch of tiered raised beds. I put it in the ground, and I had a hard time keeping the foliage from turning yellow on me. They, wanted to, they didn't want to stay green. They wanted to go more yellow, and I'd load them up with sulfur. I'd feed them all these acidic soil uh, fertilizers. Still, I was always struggling to keep them. I put this in a container, put it in potting soil, game changer, just like that. Potting soil is mainly a good potting soil, like our water's potting soil. This is mainly peat moss, main ingredient, peat moss. Peat moss is really, really acidic. And it's a soil that drains, so as you water it, flushes out some of that alkalinity. That white ring that builds up in your bathtub or your toilet, that kind of, in your sinks, that also builds up in your soil. And it really affects plants like blueberries. You'll have smaller fruits, less fruits will tend to be trimmed towards yellow, it'll drop some leaves. That's all indications of, I'm just not happy, the pH is off in my soil. So I, I, grow, my, I grow blueberries in containers or raised beds, and I grow them in potting soil so I can control the pH mainly. And those of you that have had hot tubs and spas and, 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 and uh, pools, you know you're always checking the pH. You also do that with your, with your plants, especially the sensitive crops. Blueberries are one of those. So that seemed to be the, the big difference. This one happens to be a dwarf variety. This is called Jelly Bean. It's just a cute name. I love it, I love good names. We need to have creative people name plants. Like someone's got to rename Hookera. Sounds like you're, that's a perennial, it's just a perennial shaped plant. It sounds like you're hacking up a fur ball, man. I'm gonna start submitting good names to these perennial growers. They need some help, but they did, they did it right with this. So jelly bean, it's a dwarf variety. It only gets like two by two, cute little thing. And you should just see it's loaded up. It's already starting to form little tiny blueberries. Still, still in bloom, but also it's pollinated enough. Blueberries are one of those. They do benefit with a buddy. They like pollinators. And it wouldn't be two jelly beans together. It needs to be two different varieties. This particular variety will produce berries by itself. But it will produce more berries if you partner it up with a blue sunshine or another variety of blueberry. You get more of it. So I've actually taken a big pot and put two boot, I'm in a big pot just put two blueberries together in the same pot. It kind of forms like one big plant, and then they just help pollinate itself. Uh, it, it really ups the, the berry count. So blueberries are unique in that way. Blackberries, self-pollinating. Grapes, they do it themselves, it only takes one. Blueberries, they appreciate a buddy. So they need to cross-pollinate. Kind of like a fruit tree is kind of that, like that. Got you're, you're full of questions in the front row, aren't you? <laughs> I like that. Well, and you get some spunk. Front, and I'll get a blueberry for the back. Yeah. Is that close enough to What I would do, bees will travel, so the bees and moths are kind of doing your, they're doing all the pollinating. Uh, they'll travel. I wouldn't put a structure in between the two of them. On my house is in between. Yeah, I would rather see them together on the, both on the front or both on the back, and you'll get, you'll get more of a benefit. I can't tell you if the bees will find it. Bees are pretty dumb. They, they aren't very good. They like to stumble into pollen. So they kind of go, Thunk. oh yeah, I should pollinate this. They focus on it. They're not good at going, I'm going to go look for more of those in the back. They, they don't tend to do that as well. So I could plant two of those in my back. I have a caged area. Oh, nice. And uh, because I have so many birds and squirrels. Birds and squirrels are really like these. Oh well, my gosh. Actually, I got mine in the cage. Oh. <laughs> um, I brought a couple of skewer things. Yeah. yeah. 
Blueberries, what is that, in full sunlight? Full sun. Full sun. Full sun. I would say for all of these, they'll need at least six hours of sun to produce good fruit. If you don't do that, they'll tend to elongate, they'll be reaching for the sun, and they, the berries won't be as large. So at least six hours. Now I'm on a fence line, so the fence line's shading it quite a bit. I think it helps me, because I'm shading the roots some, but the top growth reaches up into the sun. I think it really helps. For, for this, for my gardens, I think it helps my gardens, because I'm protecting the, 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 uh, the roots a little bit. Um, also, I tend to, I love mulch. I love shredded cedar bark. I love shredded cedar bark. It's pretty, smells good. Cedar is a repelling action towards insects, especially things like ants. Uh, ants love to crawl up things, especially my figs, that kind of stuff. They love to get into my fig trees. Um, so that I'll use that to kind of keep them at bay. And I, I'll put a two, three inch layer around the roots. And I think that helps insulate, cool, holds moisture, keeps weeds down, all those benefits that you learn about it as a gardener, I think it helps with those. So I, I use a lot of that, especially around my berries. Um, I just use a lot of it around my plants. I think it looks more natural than taking a rock lawn and going right up to the trunk of an apple tree. That just does not look right. That looks sterile. It looks like, oh, where, where did they come from? What's going on here? Um, doesn't say I'm a gardener. A uh, current, I'm, I'm gonna pull out the old fashioned fruits, okay? These are ones your grandparents grew and made jellies and jams out of. Currants grow like a weed, and they produce heavy, okay? So you can grow a currant. This is a big bush. Basically, it's a bush, okay? Elmerberry, old, old-fashioned, big bush. This one gets up pretty good-sized. Elmerberry, whatever. It does very, very well here, and it's almost a weed. And then I brought a funky one. This is a dwarf. It's really the only way to have a nectarine. This is a dwarf nectarine. It only gets this big, pint-sized. You can grow that in a pot. You can grow it in a, in a right at the edge of the patio where you entertain because it's just cute. And it's small enough you can cover it because nectarines, they bloom really early. So you can easily cover it, protect it from, from frost. So something funky. This doesn't pertain to this class and this subject matter, but just cute. It looks good. I'm going to share it with you. Let's go over how to plant, and then, uh, then we'll take questions and we'll be done. Okay? But we should cover insects too. In the back. No, what I do with my currants, I give it a haircut to keep it shapely. I want it, otherwise it tends to get a little mangy and it wants to reach out and bite me because the currants have thorns like a blackberry. And so it's cute, it looks innocent, but when it gets real thick, it'll tend to get, get some, some thorns on it, wants to scratch it and bite you. So I just kind of keep it trimmed back for, for myself, my gardens. yeah. Are currants red or black? Uh, red. Both. red. They can be both, yeah, they can be both. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Oh, how to plant. When you plant these, in a nutshell, you'll need three things. You're going to need some mulch. Do I have mulch? Mulch. You're going to need mulch. Let's get this for the camera. There you go. You're going to need mulch. You're going to need a root and grow. And you're going to need a food. All-purpose plant food. Every time you plant, especially edibles. How deep do you plant? This is a two gallon size container. It's a standard size. Probably our most popular size because it's small. It's big enough to have a big plant, but it's small enough to plant easily in a yard. You're only going as deep as the bucket. All these plants, most of the roots go sideways. They're going just underneath the surface of the ground and they're looking for food and water because that's where the food and water is. There's nothing down there for them for most of our yards. There's just more caliche rock boulders, more clay. There's no water, food, organic, there's nothing down there for them, so they go sideways. If you know that's how they're gonna grow, give, encourage them. So you wanna dig up a hole that's three times the width, so this wide, this wide, this wide, oh, and around, okay? And just this deep. And then you're gonna mend that dirt with soil, and you're gonna mend that with about 25% compost to your native earth. It's got to get used, if it's going to the ground, it's got to get used to that soil sometime. But we want to help it get, we want to encourage more root hairs to form faster. Uh, it's all about roots, especially with edible plants. It's 
all about the roots. The larger the root mass, the more fruit you're going to have, the faster. Okay? So that will really make a difference. Now, I have bumped that up, that mulch, to, to soil. I've gone as high as 50-50. I don't like to go that high because it can be a little soggy. The mulch holds the moisture in quite a bit. I don't like to go quite that high, but if you hit a big rock, some of you are on rock piles. All it takes is one boulder, and all of a sudden you're into more mulch because you don't have enough soil. Or you hit that debris pile where the contractor buried all the junk in your yard. You got bricks and all, all kinds of stuff down there. All of a sudden you're pulling that out, you'll just need to add a little more. So if you need to, you can bump that up a bit. But generally speaking, it's one shovel of mulch for three shovels of, of native soil. Okay? And blend that together. Use that to backfill around this, this root ball. Okay, when I'm all done, I'm going to sprinkle some of this all-purpose plant food on top. Some folks will say, do I put it in the ground? Do I put it on top? Or where do I put that? I've done it both ways. It doesn't seem to matter. So if it doesn't matter, I'm into shortcuts. I want the easiest possible way to guard myself. And so I find it's just make, blend the mulch up, backfill, sprinkle this on top because it's just fast. And so I'll sprinkle some of that on. This is uh, all-purpose plant food. It's a, The main ingredient is cottonseed meal. It's got some bird guano, and I put some fairy dust in it. You know, just magic stuff. It's got iron and sulfur. It's a good all-natural food. The great thing with natural foods, every time you water or it rains, it's going to release a little food every time over a very long period of time as it breaks down. That's really important for your, for your, your fruiting plants. They need a long, consistent food cycle. They'll, they'll, they'll perform better for you. So I would say, especially with, with your fruiting plants, stay away from synthetics, your, your petroleum-based products, which is most of your Scots and your bigger names, they're gonna be synthetic foods. They release all at once, right now, they're like a hit of food, right now, it's like, like adrenaline junkie, you get more, more, and then it just flushes out of the ground and it's gone, and the plant is left wanting. And so it'll, it'll affect the fruit. If you give it organics or better, it's just safer anyway. You're dealing with edible crops. Just makes sense. When I'm all done, I'll water it in with the root and grow. It's a rooting hormone. This is like B1. Remember, as a, your grandparents used a lot of B1. This is not B1, but what fact what we found with B1 is there was no difference. University testing, we tested B1 water in this product. B1 and water, there was no increase in root size at all. The B1 changed the pH a little bit, but that was it. There's no other. It was water in a bottle they were selling you. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we saw that, we stopped selling that. We, we, we started going with this product. It's got a real mild fertilizer to it. And it's uh, that dipping powder that you use for cuttings, it's like for house plants, or you take a draining cutting, you dip it. It's this, that, in liquid form. It helps it root more. So you will get more root mass, because you're gonna do some damage to this when you pull it out. This is the only home it's ever known. This is like open heart surgery. It's, and brain surgery together at the same time. It is traumatic. You're gonna pop this thing out and start planting it in the soil, and then you're probably gonna massage or root some. It's gonna go into shock. And so this, this product helps it uh, stabilize and then helps it form every root hair that got broken. It'll help it form more multiple root hairs off of that. So it really makes a difference. I'll use this every two weeks until I see the plant stabilized. Once I see, and you'll know, because you'll see new growth, it'll start blooming, more fruits will be. As soon as I see it out of that stress, I no longer give it to them. I no longer give it any of this stuff, okay? Three things always whenever you plant. Uh, don't plant in a divot, don't listen to Phoenix. All those gardeners tell you to plant in a little, little divot hole. It'll help you to rain harvest. Well, when it's 100 degrees out at midnight, you can get away with that. But up here, we cool down. And we actually get rain because the, the monsoons come and they dump, they hit the mountains, they just dump their, to get over the hills, they dump all their rain on us. So the 100 year average, you get 19 inches of rain a year. That's a lot of rain in a, in a, in a year's time. We get it all at one time, we get it all at once, but we get a lot of rain. If that hole, if that thing is sitting in a, in a slight divot, it'll have your regular irrigation that you're doing and an afternoon rain, usually it'll die in August, September, first part of October. It literally will drown. So a lot of you, especially that 69 corridor going out towards Cordes Junction, Dewey, Mayer, the ranch, Yellow by Hills, you all have some serious clay soil. 
I mean, it is thick. You've got the caliche layers really heavy out there. Layers of like concrete going through the ground. If that plant is sitting in a slight divot, it won't be able to breathe, it won't, won't perk well enough, and so it'll tend to have issues mid, mid to late summer. Okay, just trust me. At ground level or a slight mound is better, or raised beds altogether, which is what I've done. Okay, that's how you plant. Uh, one last thing that I do, this is way over and beyond. I use Aquaboost crystals whenever I plant. These are soil polymers. Polymers are those, jump, those uh, crystals that hold like 200 times their weight in water. So they swell up, this will swell up and make like a five gallon bucket, it's like huge. But I infused our polymers, we infused them with, with uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Now we're really getting deep into science, into the garden stuff. But fun, mycorrhizal fungi are those the living organisms in the soil that encourage plants to root. So you'll run into these in your gardens. If you're digging the soil, you'll see this gray or white kind of cottony mass. Not, not cottony, it's like, a, like it's been eating the organics and stuff. Those are mycorrhizal colonies. And so if you can take those and add those, whenever I run into those, I start sprinkling them around the yard. And, Ooh, this is good stuff. This is great. I'll spread that. When plants see those mycorrhizal colonies, they go, wow, something's going on in the soil. I, I got a root here. Some of you are actually growing in dead soil. When they built your house, they came on the backhoe and they scraped off every bit of topsoil you had. And they scooched it off the side and they put your footers in, your driveways, your patios, and, you, and, and you're left with no topsoil. Literally, you'll plant something and three years later, it hasn't grown. It's still sitting there, the same size. That's an indication that you've got dead soil. And so, if you can introduce your mycorrhizal fungi back into the soil, and then have a product that holds moisture around, AquaBoost will hold the moisture around the root balls, and it, it, it uh, seeds or repopulate your mycorrhizal colonies, so you get more growth. So you got a plant that encourages roots, you got a product that encourages roots and, and retains the water around it. So every time I plant, I sprinkle a little bit of this in the bottom of the hole for, for my own gardens. Whether it's a tomato, really good for containers container gardens, because it's holding the water in. It's just if you're using this stuff, make sure you train yourself to not water so much. So if you're watering every day, this plant will hold the moisture around there and the plants will, you have to really train yourself, oh, I should wait till the plant, you can go twice as long in between water cycles if you're using these kind of products. Okay? It really makes a difference in my gardens. And I would say this is over and beyond, at least do this. But I, I get one of these a year and I just sprinkle around the garden. Yes? Um, you know you're over watering when you see it start to come out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's obviously used it. So polymer crystals as they swell. I've actually had some plants levitate out of the pot, especially in little pots. I'll sprinkle it in uh, dry, then I'll water it and start swelling up. The plants actually start to rise up out of the pot. I'm like, oh, okay, I should have I realized. <laughs> It really works well, so it's a great product in a dry climate. I've been playing with polymers for a lot, for a couple decades. And I finally came up with this one. Once I started embedding the, the fungi with it, it really was a game changer. It helped my, my, my gardens. Yeah. You said uh, sprinkling around. So would it actually help, even though I have some plants of ground, go ahead and sprinkle that around? Well, Don't sprinkle it on top of the soil. You'd want to work it in, so a big screwdriver, a piece of rebar, hook it in the ground, try to swiggle around, try to get it in where the roots are. You'll get more benefit where, where the roots are at for established plants. Really works well if you're travelers, let's say RVers, or you like to cruise. Your house plants really makes a difference for your house plants because now you're putting it, it's, it helps you go twice as long before you gotta, gotta water. So instead of once a week, you're now every two weeks for your water cycles. Really makes a difference, okay? Other last question, we can cover bugs. So that is good for like roses and everything. This, this I use on every time I plant. But I think that there's really a benefit to your edibles, your anything edible, because it's all about keeping consistency of moisture and encouraging deeper roots. Well, this does both. So Aqua Boost is, and it looks a little hokey, I know. It's a ball jar. I go down to Walmart and I buy these. And we make this stuff in the back. We get little people, little elves, and come in after night. And, they put, and we stick a little sticky label on it. It was the least expensive container I could find for this particular product. So we're making it right here. Okay, called Aqua Boost Crystals. 
bugs. There's not a lot of insects that get on my grapes. There's an old caterpillar called a grape leaf skeletonizer. It's a cute little bug. It's got yellow and black stripes. It's cute as can be. You just want to pick them up, play with them, put them back on the grapes. But they scrape all the foliage off of your, off your grapes. They come in midsummer. That's the only real bug I've had other than birds. can come in every once in a while. You eat a few, few, a few grapes. That's OK. Um, I do spray this stuff. For, el um, for leaf skeletonizers of all types. This is an organic, it's called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. <laughs> Captain Jack's, yeah! Yeah, I matey. Okay, so anyway, Captain Jack's, we don't want you to forget the name, it's a great organic fertilizer. I think you can spray it up to just a couple days prior to harvest. So read the directions, but it really wipes out thrip. All, it wipes out everything except for aphids. I wish it would take out aphids. So I'm trying to figure out how to mix a, a a neem oil with this so I get a knockdown, but I can't find a manufacturer that will make it for me. I'm such a small player. They just don't, I talk to them, they go, hey, he's so cute. One <laughs> store in the middle of Arizona. No, we're not doing that for you. But I know it will really work to knock them out. Eventually we'll get that. But right now, this does everything but, but aphids quite effectively. And so, especially on edibles, because you want to keep that organic. If you can, you don't want to spray a bunch of chemicals on the apples and pears and peaches and blackberries and stuff. <laughs> Other than that, I use Home Harvest. This is neem oil, N-E-E-M, the organic gardeners. Neem is a fancy organic. It, this does wipe out aphids. This is my first line defense for everything, uh, especially for little, my container gardens especially. I'll just spritz that around. You can spray this up to the day of harvest, and it's still organic. So quite, quite effective. It even works on powdery mildew, if you can catch it early. That white uh, coating that gets on the foliage, it works quite, quite well on that, okay? So roses, that kind of stuff. With that, that's my talk today. That's all I got for you. Questions, yes? On the grapes, what's that white slimy stuff that comes in the Ooh, that's a, that's a spittle bug. Oh. Spittle, spittle bug. Um, it's a little tiny insect, a little gray, um, kind of tan colored insect underneath that goo, that loogie, that's sitting there on top of the, 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 the surface. There's a bug and he, he does that, he oozes, to keep the birds and other predator uh, insects off of them. The neem oil wipes them right out. Okay. Um, the Captain Jacks, I'm not sure to look on that, but I think it, I don't know. I, usually I'll use neem on that because they'll have these little tiny pussy white things on the ground. I'll just go through and spot treat them okay. as I see them. Yes? Yeah, your blackberries, do you have to be as careful with the mulch touching the cane too, or just the soil? I, I am careful with that. I generally don't think, I don't let dirt and stuff gather up against. Now, my bramble patches are so big anymore, I'm less careful with it because they're just so established. They're starting to send up canes every place. You kind of go, eh, they're, they're fine. So, but generally I'll try, even on my fruit trees, I try to not let them, I'll just have a little ring around here, but I put it around this. I have a nice little mulchy, cedary looking mounds. Okay, yeah. Okay, so good question. Is the potting soil good enough for blueberries to keep the soil, the acidity down, keep, keep it more acidic? It should be enough. Yeah. What I, I don't use sulfur in my container gardens. I love sulfur. I use it on everything in the spring. So I've already, in the month of March, I go spread this on everything in the yard, the lawn, the thyme lawn, the fruit tree, everything. And then I'll also put soil sulfur on everything in the yard in the spring, in the month of March. So I've already done that. In fact, the rains, I know, uh, I took an Instagram photo of my clematis that opened up with the rains. Because all that food I put down became activated uh, when, when the rains came. It's just a huge purple flower. And so it, it activated. I don't use sulfur in my containers because I'm a gardener. I'm also an American. You know, more is better, bigger, more. Uh. And we're generous. We tend to go a little more often than we should. And I've killed some things in my containers because I put too much sulfur. I made it too acidic. I find in my container gardens, this is acidic enough. And I do put 2.5% sulfur in this already. So I, I only use this in my container gardens for my raspberries, just for flowers, whatever. I only use this. Okay. Good question. Any last questions and we'll release. If we didn't get to your questions, I'll just hang out. 
and I'll, and I'll finally end up over next to the grape section. I'll just go hang out there and help them.